Today we're talking about the mysteries of the Minoans. All right. Um, I keep promising I will put this up each time, and I will. As soon as we can get back, and, and, and Carol, and I'm not going to take credit for this, Carol is the one that does this, when she gets the videos processed and put up, they will be on a page called the Windstar Talks that will be on our website, liteachapala.org. Um, and again, my, web, my email address there in case anybody needs to write me if you have a question, you have trouble getting onto the website or whatever. Please don't expect this is going to be up on Monday after we arrive back on you know this weekend because it's going to take a while to get home and work. She was actually working on the, the uh, reducing the the PowerPoints. Uh, you have to compress them in order to get them on on the web. So she was working on that this morning. But do let me know if you have any questions. We are talking today about the mystery of the Minoans. This afternoon we will do our last talk of the trip, and that will be the unlikely rise of Greece. But today is kind of a lead into that because today. We're actually going to, you're getting a twofer today, all right? We're going to talk about the Minoans, but I'm also going to get into the Mycenaeans and tell you about them because those two ancient cultures, the Minoan culture first, and which was on a, the island of Crete, where we're going to be tomorrow, and you'll see the <coughs> Minoan, um, the Palace of Gnosis and other uh, artifacts. That culture was first. In fact, the culture of the Minoans on the island of Crete is considered the first civilization in all of Europe. Um, and then the next civilization to come along, which we believe may have been responsible for the decline of the Minoans, were the Mycenaeans. Whereas the Minoans were on the island of Crete, the Mycenaeans were on the mainland. They were in the Peloponnese, the Peloponnesian Peninsula uh, of Greece. This obviously is Crete. This is Greece as we know it. This big sort of thumb sticking out here is the Peloponnese or the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And Mycenae is right there. Now I'll talk about Mycenae in a few minutes, but let's talk for a little bit about uh, the Minoans. Uh, well, I will say, um, we have, until the 20th century, we knew virtually nothing about Greek civilization before about 750 BC. Here, we're talking about, as you can see, as far back as 1700 BC. That's a big gap, a thousand years. The only thing we knew about ancient Greece, we knew from myths, from stories that were part of the Greek oral tradition that passed down to us, the mythology. And by the way, don't ever make a mistake between the Greek pagan religion and mythology. The idea that they believed in the pagan gods, Zeus and all the others, and worshipped them and they had temples to them is different than mythology. Mythology are just stories, usually about the gods doing something, but that was the mythology is not part of their worship. It was stories they told about them, okay, about the gods and about people involved in that. So before the 20th century, we knew almost nothing. And um, in well, 1899, a man named Sir Arthur Evans decided that there might be something to the legend of King Minos, which was a Greek myth, and King Minos having uh, his wife, uh, Paphia, getting pregnant by a bull and having uh, a son that had the body of a man and the head of a bull. Well, Arthur Evans was a very wealthy English man, and he decided there might be something to this. So he decided to go to Crete, buy land, and start digging. Well, he discovered a bunch of things we're going to look at, but one of the things is he started a process by which they began to discover that not only were there a number of sites for a civilization which he named the Minoan after King Minos of the Greek myth, but they began to find uh, other sites in other places throughout the Aegean Sea to, to deter, and determine that those were colonies that were planted by this civilization, the earliest European civilization, which was located on Crete. Uh, you'll notice these, these sort of boxy looking things from where you are, are the sites of palaces that were later identified. He started in the area of Gnosis, which we're going to visit tomorrow. Uh, but then they've also identified that Akrotiri, which is on one end of the island of Santorini, which was called Thera back then, was a major palace and a major center for Minoan culture. They also went to a number of other islands and to the mainland of Turkey, 
Subsequently, once we began discovering this stuff, we, like I did it, right? Once they just started discovering this stuff, they also began to found, find Minoan artifacts and art in Syria, in Egypt, um, a lot of other places, and some, they think, were Minoan even as far away as the coast of Spain. So the idea is very clear now that the Minoan culture not only existed, and you're going to see some images that tell you they were very civilized, very sophisticated, but they traveled extensively, and they apparently traded with people. So we find their jewelry, their ceramics, their you know various other things all over the Mediterranean, not just the Eastern Mediterranean, but as I say, as far as the coast of Spain. Now, the Greek myth, of course, as I said, was that King Minos of Crete had a wife. His wife name was uh, Pasiphae. She gets pregnant by a bull. Don't even think about that. Uh, and she has a son who has the body of a human, the head of a bull. Well, out of compassion, King Minos doesn't want to kill this creature. So he creates, in the myth now, he creates in his basement, the basement of his palace, a labyrinth, a maze. And in that maze, he keeps the minotaur, as it's called, so that he can't escape and he feeds, you know, feeds the minotaur. Some, some versions, I would say, he fed the minotaur virgins. Um, it's a myth, okay? But he, so he imprisons the minotaur in the labyrinth. Well, as I say, Sir Arthur Evans, this wealthy, eccentric British guy, in 1899, he'd been reading these myths, and he said, I think there might be something to this. Mm. After all, it's been we've discovered over the last several hundred years that a lot of ancient myths actually did have some basis in reality. So he goes to Crete, he bu buys up land, and he starts digging. To everyone's amazement, and I bet even to his amazement, he started finding stuff. In fact, in Gnosis, which is the place where he started, he found the ruins of a great palace. And in that palace, he started finding a lot of artifacts of bulls. In fact, beautiful artifacts of bulls. These are actually were found uh, on Crete in the Minoan palaces. There's also a lot of symbolism of the horns of a bull. Now, we do know that in a lot of ancient cultures, the the, the horns of a bull were considered the symbol of power. In fact, altars in ancient Canaan and Mesopotamia, altars to other gods, even the Hebrew altars, frequently would have horns on them because that was a symbol of power. And so you see images like that throughout the Minoan uh, palaces. We even have, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute, uh, representations of bulls with people kind of playing with them. So Sir Arthur Evans discovers all of this, and he, to his shock and amazement, but probably a little neener neener in there, in the basement of this palace, it seemed like he found a labyrinth. <laughs> Holy minotaur. <laughs> Later on, they discovered it wasn't actually a labyrinth. But, um, but at the time, he thought it was a labyrinth. He names the civilization, the Minoan civilization, after King Minos, and that started the whole thing. And they found more stuff and more stuff now. There's still, despite all the archaeology that's been done and all the artifacts that have been found, we still have a very limited knowledge of the Minoan culture. The reason being that while we have artifacts, there's two parts of cultural anthropology. I had this conversation, you know, with with uh, we have an anthropologist or an archaeologist on board. Uh, archaeology and written history, both are necessary to have a complete picture because written history is the story of what happened and of the legends and myths and everything else. Archaeology is the stuff they left behind. You need both the stuff they left behind, which we have for the Minoans, and the written history to have an accurate understanding of what they were like. We don't have any written history. We have a language that has never been translated, okay, which has the very uncreative uh, name of Linear A. I think they could have done better than that. Minotauran or something would have been a much better name for the language, but Linear A has never been translated. We also, um, there have been some problems with Sir Arthur Evans because he was so enthusiastic that as he discovered things, he would decide that it was, you know, it was something, you know, this, this was the labyrinth where the Minotaur was kept. 
There was also a suggestion many years later that he and his assistants were actually reproducing some things and selling them as actual artifacts from the archaeological site. I don't want to diminish Sir Arthur Evans because it, if it had not been for his passion, his enthusiasm, and he spent his own money, then we would never, perhaps, or certainly not as early, have found the Minoan civilization. But he was not a professional archaeologist. He was an amateur archaeologist, and some of the things he did were pretty amateur. Okay. But we are grateful for what he did. So what do we know about these people? Well, we know that they were a naval people. Not only because we have found their artifacts and uh, even palaces, colonies they planted in other places, but we also have these kind of images. The, the naval um, themes are common throughout all of the, the Minoan palaces, the Minoan culture. And they did a lot of painting. We have a lot of images. That's part of what we've discovered in all of these palaces. Now, people had lived on Crete probably since about 130,000 BC. The most ancient of artifacts carry it way back. And before this class, somebody said, well, how did the people get there? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, in fact, you know the Contiki expedition, right? Mm -hmm. Where they did the papyrus boat? Well, the whole point of doing that was to try to prove that even though nobody thought it was possible, it was possible using very primitive boats or whatever for people to travel from one place to the other. But we don't know how people got to Crete, this island in the, you know, in the middle of the Aegean Sea or at the, the southern end of the Aegean Sea, um, but they did. And apparently they were there from about 130,000 uh, uh, years ago. But about uh, 2700 BC, this particular civilization, the Minoan civilization, started. And really, they started building these large palaces, these urban centers, sometime around 2000 BC. And they continued at it for about 600 years. So between 2000 and about 1400 BC was really the, the, the focal point of this Minoan culture. The largest Minoan center, I, suggest, I, I mentioned a minute ago, is Gnosis, which we are going to visit. And the palace in Gnosis was the first place that was ever uh, excavated by Sir Arthur Evans. But another major site is Akrotiri, which is on the island of Santorini. Have you all been to Santorini? Um, it really is quite extraordinary in a lot of ways. But it used to be called Thera, and that was another major center for the Minoan culture. Um, the navy is very important. It obviously was how they ended up being a trading people. But it's also true that uh, one of the phenomena of the Minoan cities is there are no walls around them. They're not fortified at all. They found no weapons. Their art, while most ancient civilizations were full, and you've seen that over the last uh, several lectures, the art usually is primarily depictions of having conquered other people, dragging them off into slavery, battering down their walls, flaying their soldiers. Uh, there's none of that in Minoan art. There's only one piece of art ever found in a Minoan site that has any suggestion that there was anything military associated with it. So they were not militaristic. That has generally caused people to believe that the Minoan civilization was peaceful, that they had a peaceful society. Other people have suggested since, because they were such a naval people, it may have been that they had such a powerful navy and they lived on an island, nobody could get to them and so they didn't have to fortify their cities that that wasn't an issue. But remember, this was the first civilization in Europe, and so there was not a lot of competition in terms of other naval powers and things like that back then. Um, remember that Egypt invented the first ships we're aware of, and they only invented those ships some probably <laughs> 650 years or so before the heyday of the Minoan civilization. So there weren't that many places probably that had ships, and the Minoans may have felt safe or they may have actually been a peaceful culture. The thing that is most noticeable about the Minoans are their palaces. This is not a shopping mall. This is a Minoan palace, or at least the artist's representation of it, based upon excavations. They were huge. The, the Gnosis Palace that you're <laughs> going to have a chance to visit tomorrow was over five acres in size. Now, we call it a palace. It probably was where the, the chief leader or king lived, but it was also a, an administrative complex. It was kind of the center of government, the center of culture for whatever that area was. But there were multiple of these palaces on the island of Crete. Um, and again, we have artist conceptions of them, but they continued to find various other artifacts and that sort of thing. These palaces were, which are called uh, anactora, 
in their language apparently, because now that we've had it translated, um, uh, or that we, we, we not have translated, but we translated the My Mycenaean, I'll explain that in a minute. So we have some carryover, but we've never actually translated the Minoan language. These palaces have dozens and dozens of interconnected rooms. They're multi-story, they all are around a central courtyard. They have staircases, both interior and exterior, exterior staircases. They have light wells, massive columns. They are very sophisticated buildings. Just building multiple stories was quite astonishing when you think about the fact that this was happening over 3,000 years ago they started doing this, all right? Um, and they are, you know, like I say, they look like modern shopping malls. They also apparently were beautiful inside based upon what we can tell. Um, large columns, wide open spaces, courtyards, um, quite extraordinary, all right? Um, they had stone paved roads in between the various sites on Crete. The uh, Homer wrote that Crete had 90 cities on it. And even though it's the, the largest of the Greek islands, 90 cities on an island this size would have been quite significant. This, they had drainage in the street system that they put in. They had water and sewage disposal in the rich houses at least. Um, the water ran through clay pipes. They had the first flush toilets. And by that I don't mean you pull the chain. What I mean is they had toilets that went into clay pipes underneath the latrines and they just poured water in after it and it washed the sewage away and they had a system for carrying away the sewage. This is 3,000, I'm sorry, 4,000 years ago. I think I said 3,000 minutes ago. 4,000 years ago that this all started. Um, quite extraordinary. And as I say, they were beautiful inside. We have a lot of frescoes, various wall paintings, that we have identified in these palaces, which are quite beautiful. A lot of them are nature scenes. You see the monkeys here, um, the um, ibex. Oh, you know, there's a there's a Cretan um, sort of ibex called a Cretan, which you I don't know if you'll have a chance to see it. Um, this is two children boxing. Um, various other depictions. Apparently, they were very much into the arts. They loved to decorate their homes. Um, they also, a lot of nautical scenes. You'll see a lot of dolphins in their pictures because they, you know, they sailed, they loved the sea. And it's understandable, both for the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The Minoans lived on uh, an island, but the Mycenaeans also had a major naval emphasis because 72% of all of Greece is within 25 miles of the ocean. And so it's understandable that there's nothing that didn't have a nautical theme throughout this whole region um, at that point. Um, they apparently had great wealth, not just because, and whenever you see signs of games, you know, boxing and things of that sort, they played games, they did art, they had ceramics. Whenever you find that sort of thing in a culture, it's a sign of the fact that their culture was not only civilized, but also had leisure time to do those things. They weren't fighting for survival all the time, you know, like some of the early civilizations or those that were, you know, very militaristic and were always in battle. And so they have, um, they have large storerooms because they had excess goods. They primarily, we know that they grew cereal grains and grapes, you know, grapes being one of the major Medi uh, Mediterranean products, as, uh, as you know, and olives, so that they have olive oil. They have these storerooms. In fact, Sir Arthur's Labyrinth in the basement of the Gnosis Palace, they now have quite definitively determined were storerooms. Large storerooms, interconnected rooms for storage. It was not a labyrinth for the Minotaur. But they had like giant Costco closets, if you know what I mean. You know that expression, Costco closet? Okay, you don't go to Costco. New houses that are built, they build large pantries in them, which they call Costco closet. Because, you know, you go and buy 80 rolls of toilet paper, you got to have some place to put it, right? Well, they had these giant storage areas. In fact, they created these large ceramic pots called pithoi to store olive oil and wine and grain and various other things. So the arts were very important. They were wealthy. They had um, an opportunity for a more leisurely lifestyle. Um, this, for instance, I mentioned, I showed you a very small version of this. Apparently, these people did bull vaulting. <laughs> now, we don't know if this was a sport or a religious act, but this is actually from the one of the palaces. 
you'll notice that this one young uh, man has a hold of the bull's horns. Another one is vaulting over his back, and it appears this one is getting ready to catch him. So these people danced with bulls. <laughs> Again, we don't know if this was, this was recreational or a sport, <laughs> or if they did it as part of a religious ceremony because they had such such admiration for the strength of the bull but this is one of the astonishing things about this culture this is how much they emphasize bulls in their whole culture now the minoans were a handsome people um, and strangely enough all the representations of women have them with white skin and all the representations of men have them with reddish brown skin it may be that this was a beauty thing right we still have, oh, she's got skin like porcelain, right? That's still a goal. Uh, the men may have wanted to look tanned and burly and that sort of thing. Women dress quite fancily, although they had a very distinctive aspect to their clothing, which you may notice there. <laughs> they had, uh, the women wore gowns or, or dresses that left their breasts exposed. All right, I'm not going to stay on this too long for the sake of the men in the audience. But we know that's true because these are actual paintings from some of the palaces. Um, men wore loincloths and skirts. Uh, there's also a suggestion, women are represented very often in the art. That, which doesn't happen very often in other cultures. When I was showing you the art of the Assyrians and the Persians and everything else, you didn't see any women, right? There are a lot of women represented in the art. The fact that it may have been, we think it may have been, a peaceful culture suggests that women were at least equal, and there may have been even a, it may have been matrilineal, that the, the authority passed through the women, not the men. There may have even been women in sig significant positions of power. We don't know that because we don't have the written language, but all of the visual art artifacts that we have, archaeological evidence, suggests that women were very important in this culture, and men were not doing everything, going out and whipping on up, up on everybody they could, and then bragging about it, and that was the focus of their whole culture. Um, when women are in charge, you ha it's a lot more peaceful. Okay, it's hard for me to say that as a man, but it's true. Okay, and so it may have been more matriarchal. As I say, they were peaceful, they were artistic, um, they produced beautiful works of art in stone, um, in gold, hammered metals, um, all silver, all sorts of things. And you will notice here, um, this is a metal vase, a ring. This is a stone carved with a bull motif. Again, the bull. All right. Uh, beautiful bracelets, medallions, extraordinary art. And this happened in a period of time when most of Europe was still banging rocks together to try to start fires. The first civilization, the more we have learned about it, the more astonishing it has been. Now, one of the things you might, I don't know if you can see it, right here, that little symbol, which we find in other places, it's a two-headed axe. Well, that was called uh, a labrus, a two-headed axe. The Romans used that symbol later on. It's believed that that labrus may have been the symbol that, that gave us the word labyrinth. And so that symbol occurs in a lot of places in the Minoan culture. Uh, I didn't have a better, I don't have a better example of it, I should have, but that's, that's the two-headed axe. It does appear in a lot of their art. Uh, in addition to metal work, they did a lot of ceramic work. I mentioned the very large pithoi, and they weren't just large, they were decorated. Again, primitive cultures, most other cultures that, that were back this long ago, they didn't take the time or they didn't have the time to decorate common articles. If they made a pot to store something in, just making the pot was about all they could manage. Well, look what the Minoans did with common storage pots. Quite extraordinary. Um, we also have painted, decorated ceramics. And some of this is the kind of stuff that we have found in other places that has distinctive Minoan design. So we know that the Minoans were trading with Syria, you know, the, the, in the Mesopotamian region, with Egypt, with, uh, with various other island areas, with Anatolia, what we know of as Turkey, and as far away as Spain. This is a fascinating image, which is seen fairly often whenever you look up information on the Minoans. It is ceramic, uh, and it's called the snake goddess. And scholars, because we don't know, they keep arguing about, okay, is this an image of a deity, a goddess, literally, they call it the snake goddess, or is this a priestess? 
of whatever the religion they were practicing that involves snakes? Or is it just a sign that, okay, women, you don't need to be afraid of snakes. You can handle this. <laughs> we don't know. But this is a common image that you see as an artistic representation of the Minoan culture. And you will notice, once again, she has the very distinctive female dress of the Minoan women. Okay. Um, I mentioned the fact that the, the language of the Minoans, which is called Linear A, has never been translated. It is a consists of syllabic symbols. This is a, a, a famous article called the Phaistos Disc. Phaistos is one of the Minoan centers on Crete, where they have a palace that they've uncovered. Now, this is a very controversial thing. Some people believe that this is made up because a lot of the, uh, that somebody created it and it's a hoax. They've not been able to prove that. But a lot of the symbols on this Phaistos disc, and it's a, it's a spiral kind of imagery of its symbols on both sides. Some of them seem to be from other uh, examples they have of the linear A language. Um, some of them don't exist anywhere else. They don't know what it says, they don't know what it was for, but it is often again pictured as an example of a Minoan culture. Because whatever, somebody took a long time to create this thing, and we, we don't know what it says. We don't know what it was for, we don't know what it means. That's why there's a lot of mysteries associated with Minoan, the Minoans. We don't know their language, we don't know who they, what gods they worshipped, was that snake goddess, you know, an, an article of, of worship, so much that we don't know. Now, Linear A was the language of the Minoans. Another language which they found uh, uh, samples of on Crete in the Minoan sites is called Linear B. Again, I think they could have done better than that. Linear A, Linear B. And I'm going to talk about Linear B, which they discovered was actually the language of the Mycenaeans from the mainland. And it's believed that the reason they found that stuff um, in, on Crete in the Minoan sites is that the Mycenaeans ended up conquering the, the, the Minoans. In terms of how the culture ended in Minoa, we do know that the whole of Crete is prone to natural disasters. They have earthquakes, various other problems, uh, because as they've dug down, they can usually tell when nat natural disasters occur because they find signs of rubble, and then sometimes if things were burned, they find, you know, burned stone and that sort of thing. Well, we do know that there were a number of natural disasters that were experienced at Crete because a lot of the palaces had to be rebuilt. And we have evidence of that. And so they had earthquakes, they would rebuild their palaces. But then around 1500 BC, the reason I've got this image up here, the island of Thera, what we know as Santorini, and if any of you all have ever gone to Santorini, the cruise ships, which is how you usually get there, they cruise into this area, and then you you climb the you know the, the face of the cliff. You either climb it, you ride a donkey up it, or you take the cable car, cable car, um, <laughs> to the top to you know to the first town you come to, Fira. And then there are towns in various parts of the island. It's not a very big island, but this island in about 1500, it was a volcanic island. It exploded, and it exploded big time. It is one of the largest volcanic explosions since human civilization began. Um, this red line is what Thera looked like before that explosion around 1500 BC. Exact date we're not sure of, but it was around 1500 BC. When it exploded, one of the things that happened is that a lot of the mud and ash came down and covered Akrotiri, which is a village on the south end of the island. Akrotiri was a Minoan colony. There's a palace there that's been identified as a Minoan palace. Well, in the same way that Pompeii was covered by mud and ash and therefore preserved when uh, Mount Vesuvius exploded, that's what happened with Akrotiri. And so the, the excavations of Akrotiri continue in order to be able to identify, but they clearly identified that this was an outpost, a palace of the Minoan people. And so Akrotiri is still being uncovered after being covered up by the volcanic explosion. But what happens when there is a major uh, volcanic explosion or a major event in the ocean? Tsunami. Tsunami. This island, Thera, as it was called, Santorini as we know it, is only 70 miles north of the island of Crete. And it's directly north. Which means there would have been a huge tidal wave. And again, we have evidence that a number of the various 
uh, Minoan outposts or cities or palaces, uh, especially on the north side of the island facing toward Thera, um, suffered from a tsunami. They suffered that, that damage. And that really set back the Minoan civilization. It didn't completely destroy it, but it really staggered it. So that um, after that happened, we believe that that started a decline, which over the next two to 300 years, the Minoan civilization began to die out. And by 1200 BC, the Minoan civilization had collapsed completely. The population plummets, the cities are abandoned. It's believed that somewhere in that period between the, uh, the explosion of Thera and the tsunami around 1500, and the actual just complete uh, loss of the Minoan civilization, that they were invaded, probably by the Mycenaeans. It's thought they may also have suffered attacks from various warlike peoples that came from uh, from Anatolia, what we know as modern day um, Turkey. So the civilization pretty much died in 1200 BC. And we've only known about this for about 100 years. And we're still finding out a lot about it. At some point, we may learn enough to be able to translate their language, but we can't right now. I'm going to shift gears now and start talking about uh, the Mycenaeans. Any questions about the Minoans? Yes, Ron. Uh, lost city of Atlantis. Well, yeah, I, mean, I was going to. I'll mention that now. I was going to get to that because this was this extraordinary culture with all of this beauty and sophistication, way ahead of its time in terms of the rest of human history, and much of it was destroyed by a tsunami by a water disaster, many scholars, or a fair number of scholars, I don't want to say many, believe that this may have been the source of the legend of Atlantis. Some of the people who work, or began working at first on Akrotiri, on the island of Thera, or Santorini, um, they believe that Akrotiri may have been the site of it, but that was, that's been pretty much dismissed. But then they began to think, well, wait a minute. When this island, Thera, exploded, and the Minoan culture, which you know, for the long time, they didn't even know about the Minoan culture, so they couldn't identify it as possibly being Atlantis. One of the other mysteries is, was this the source of the myth of Atlantis? That the myth of Atlantis, um, we find out about from the writings of Plato. Plato talks about Atlantis. Now, it's always been kind of confusing because he says it's outside the pillars of Hercules, which traditionally meant the, the Gibraltar, the Stra Straits of Gibraltar in between Spain and North Africa. Well, it's not there, of course, but this idea of this brilliant, learned, wealthy, artistic culture that was destroyed or pretty much destroyed, and, and the, history, the tradition is that it was sunk, the island of Atlantis was sunk, it may have been that, that the Minoan civilization was the source of that. That's one of the other mysteries of the Minoans. <clears throat> Any other questions about the Minoan peoples? How, how big was the title? We don't know. 15, 1500 BC, there's no way for us to measure it for sure. I mean, there, I'm sure there are experts who know, but I don't know. Uh, it would have been very substantial. When an island that big blows up 70 miles north, then you know that the tsunami is going to be very significant. Yes? Um, the question, as I, if I heard this correctly, was what about the idea that the Minoans may have had a link to the Egyptian civilization? Well, we, we have evidence that they traded with Egypt because we have found what appear to be, clearly appear to be, Minoan artifacts in Egypt. Again, the idea of shipping, they may have been the only two civilizations in around 2000 that already had ships that could, could travel that far. And so there very likely was a link, whether or not um, you know, there were, as I say, there were people there far earlier even than the Egyptian civilization, and the development of the civilization was fairly early. Um, it, there's enough of a difference that it doesn't appear as, to me at least, and there may be people who disagree with this, that the Minoan civilization was in any way a, a product of the Egyptian, but certainly those two civilizations, which were two of the earliest and most sophisticated, that they did have interaction. Actually, you know, around, well, that they may have had some interaction. Are you aware of some theories that they may have actually been a product of the Egyptians? I have to do a paper back in uh, years ago. Okay. Many years ago about the Minoan civilization. All right. So you have a scholarly interest. Well, that's not scholarly. <laughs> it was more I to do a paper and I had to figure yeah. out some stuff. And there was a couple of historians that were theorizing that the Minoans were 
guys that uh, it was an offshoot of uh, Egyptian civilization. Interesting. Because of the, the art they were trying to compare. Yeah. The yeah, it's, there's a little bit of difference uh, in my perception, and, and there, there could be something to that. I'm not aware of that, but the, um, the Minoan art seems to me to be far less formal. I mean, you saw the images, you know, there are people playing and dolphins jumping, and it's very organic, very, very simple in a sophisticated kind of way. I mean, like the cave drawings are simple, but extraordinary. But it, the Minoan art, whereas the the Egyptian art tended to be very formalized. I mean, you know, this kind of thing. Very, almost static, compared to the sort of organic imagery and the, the naturalistic kind of thing that the Minoans had. Uh, that's not, neither one is better or worse, but they, it seems to me as though they were different. But I'm not, I'm, I don't claim to be an authority, you know, on all the details of this, so that's possible. Anything else? Okay, let's talk about Mycenae. The second great culture, in this region was the culture of Mycenae. And it's a little it's a little bit of a mistake to talk about the Mycenaean culture. This is the town of Mycenae. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures in a minute that we, we took there. It's, it's, it's worth the visit if you ever have the opportunity. Like when you go back to Athens, I would recommend you go to Corinth, which is right there, go to Mycenae. If you haven't been up to Delphi, go there. So spend a couple more weeks, you know, visit these <laughs> places, it's worth doing. Um, the, uh, it actually doesn't take that long. I mean, you can drive to Mycenae in a couple, few hours from Athens, so it's not not a big deal. Um, the Mycenaean culture, uh, Mycenaean culture, was not one culture. It actually was a combination of a lot of different city states. You will remember I talked a little bit in this, we talked about empires that Greece or Mycenae, being early Greek, was not one big country. They didn't think in terms of a country like the empires of Mesopotamia. They were individual city-states which were linked by some common culture and some common language. So during the Mycenaean period, there were a lot of different kind of outposts. That's what all these red dots are that the Mycenaean peoples were responsible for. The reason we call it the Mycenaean culture is that Mycenae is the largest of the cities that we have found that represent that culture in that period of time. But there was a lot of independence between the city-states. Now. In many ways, the Mycenaean culture was the, the absolute opposite of the Minoans in almost every way imaginable. For instance, the Mycenaeans were warlike people. The Minoans traded and they planted colonies, but we have no evidence they were warlike. They didn't fortify their cities, we didn't find weapons, they don't have images. The Mycenaeans, on the other hand, were, most of their art are battle scenes, you know, just like the Persians and Assyrians and folks. Um, they have these large cities that are always fortified. They're built on hills, on defensive locations. They're surrounded by significant walls. They don't have courtyards you know, the, in the palaces. Uh, those are enclosed. The, the center of the palaces, the very middle, so the most defensible, is the throne room, which was called a megaron. So all of you can now go home and name your throne room um, the megaron. Okay, there's something you can take home with you. The megaron. Now, whatever you call the throne room. Um, they were ruled by the military, whereas the Minoans featured the bull because of its strength. The Mycenaeans featured the lion because of its ferocity. All right? The idea of being militaristic. Um, and again, there, there's a strong naval theme because, as I said, 72% of all of Greece is within 25 miles of the ocean. So you get a strong naval theme. The Mycenaean culture especially is represented in another myth, and that is the story of Troy. Another myth that was thought to be made up. Homer's Iliad, which was written down about 750 BC, um, is the story of, or actually written down later than that, it was, it was first orally transmitted in 750 BC, probably not written down for 250 years later because it was there were oral traditions in there. but. It's a record of a, a, uh, a novelized, you know, rewritten for television kind of, version of the Trojan Wars. The Trojan Wars were between um, the Greek city-states during the Mycenaean region and the city of Troy, which is in Anatolia, up here right across the Dardanelles, from the mainland of, of Europe. Okay? The city of Troy, again, was thought to be a myth. 
And then Schliemann found it, and now, you know, everybody says, well, we should have known that all along. We should have listened to Homer. But Homer writes the story of Troy, and the story is, if you don't know the legend of Troy, that Menelaus was the king of Sparta. Sparta is over here. Okay, we're going to visit. That's, you have an opportunity to visit the site of ancient Sparta in two days when we land at Monabasia. Monabasia is along here. Okay, um, the king of Sparta, Menelaus, was married to supposedly the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen. Well, Menelaus's brother was Agamemnon, who was the king of Mycenae. So Menelaus was the king of Sparta. His brother Agamemnon was the king of, of uh, Mycenae. Paris, the prince from Troy, ends up stealing away, although there's a suggestion she was participating, participating in this, stealing Helen away from Menelaus and taking her back to Troy. Um, I don't know, they met at the mall or something. And so <laughs> Helen runs off with Paris they run back to Troy, which was a heavily fortified city. They lock themselves in. Menelaus is determined to go back and get his wife. And he calls on his brother, Agamemnon, who is the king of uh, My Mycenae, which is the largest of the cities at that time, and said, help me. So those two and others from the Greek city-states get their armies together. They launch their ships, and they head for Troy. This is why Helen is called, her, her beauty is described as the face that launched a thousand ships because a thousand ships supposedly left to go get her back. So they go to Troy, they start a protracted siege of the city, and it involves the hero Achilles fighting for the Greek cities, and the hero Hector fighting for Troy. Hector's apparently a brilliant, you know, he's, he's presented as this most noble and honorable guy, whom Achilles, the greatest warrior of ancient times, kills brutally, mutilates his body, and then is dragging his body around behind his chariot for a long time just to show how, you know, show how, what they're going to do to the Trojans. Hector did not end well, even though he was the most noble character probably in the whole story. Finally, you know, after a protracted siege where they can't, neither side can win, the Trojans are locked in their city, and one night they wake up, the Greek armies are gone, and there's a giant horse made out of wood parked outside their gate, which they perceive as being a, a token of a, a gift given to the city by the Greeks as a way of acknowledging, okay, you guys win, we lose, here's a present for you. So they pull the, this giant horse into the city, as you know, the Trojan horse, and that night, Greek soldiers <laughs> climb out of it, the Greek army under cover of darkness has come back, they open the gates, the Greek soldiers come in, they conquer the city of Troy. That's the legend of Troy. And it's because of that, as we talked about, because the Greeks defeated Troy through trickery, that a lot of the cities along the coast here became Greek in their orientation. They were absorbed once they had been part of the Trojan Empire, they were, or uh, kingdom, they were uh, absorbed into the Greek side with the defeat of Troy. Now that was thought to be just a legend. That's the story of Homer's Iliad. And this afternoon I'm gonna talk a little bit about Homer's Iliad. The writings of Homer in ancient Greek times, the classical Greek times especially, we have no concept of how important they were. I mean, we, you know Homer's Odyssey, the story of Odysseus and his, well, Odysseus, uh, Odysseus fought in the Trojan War. The Odyssey is his story of trying to get back home, and the gods keep doing things to keep him from getting there, and so he has all these adventures. We, the Odyssey is more popular in modern days. The Iliad far, was far more important to the ancient Greeks. We have no conception of how important the writings of Homer were. If you took, you know, by comparison, relatively speaking, the, the writings of Shakespeare and the writings of, you know, of, of the Bible and everything else that we have today in terms of emphasis, Homer would exceed that to the Greeks. When they have found um, ancient libraries, more than half of the books are either Homer or their commentaries on Homer. All right? Huge deal. And so this legend of Troy, the Iliad, was a great, you know, a very important thing, and yet was thought to be made up. Homer made it up, this blind oral poet. It got passed out, it got written down by other people, and you know, this isn't real. Well, they found it. And then later, they started finding, like Mycenae and others, and discovered that there was a lot of truth to this thing. Again, never completely discount myths or traditions or legend. 
Because over and over again, we have been finding out that there's more to them than we realized. Okay, Troy exists. The Minoan civilization existed. They did emphasize both, all of that. This is the city of Mycenae, the place where you can go. And you'd be surprised how much of it is still identified from this picture. Uh, this is the main gate, which, which is called the, the Lion's Gate. And I will show you the, a picture of the Lion's Gate, which still is there. It's called the Lion's Gate because there are sculptures of two lions right over the gate, remember? Whereas the Minoans honored the bull as a sign of strength, the Mycenaeans honored the lion as a sign of ferocity, okay, of victory. This area is a burial area. And when they uncovered or they began to excavate the burial area, they did find bones. They also found a huge number of artifacts, gold, jewelry, death masks, all kinds of stuff. And all of this is, you know, you now enter here. The, a lot of the walls are still existent. You walk up the hill, and this was the main palace area. And um, while it's just ruins, it's surprising how much of that is still <coughs> identifiable. There are extraordinary gates that lead into other areas. This is on a hilltop looking out over the valley where they still to this day are growing the same crops in many cases that they were growing 3,400 years ago when this civilization was really uh, at its peak 3,400, 3,200 years ago. So this lion's gate, as I say, still exists and I can prove it. There's my lovely wife Carolyn saying, and it's this high. <laughs> This is the lion gate. These are uh, sculpted lions. Now, 3,400 years ago, how did they do that? That lintel stone, I forget how many tons it is, but it's like 100 tons, they estimate. How did they put that up there? You know, you couldn't get enough people around that to lift it. Um, and so extraordinary building, and, and it's a mystery. We, I was talking to, with someone about that. You go to locations like this ancient times and you see this kind of construction, I mean the, the pyramids. They keep trying to figure out how they did that. Somebody claims they know how and then others say no, that's not possible. Um, some of this stuff is even more extraordinary. This is, this is not inside the city. This is just before you get to the city. This is called the Treasury of Atreus. And when you go in, this is a, a friend of ours who was on the trip that, that we visited this. You go, so you get some idea of the scale. Again, the lentil is huge, but there's a stone in this wall, which I, I don't have a picture here for, but I did take pictures of it, which probably is four, four or five times that size, and it's in the, mid, in the middle of the wall. How did they do that? I don't know. You go in here, and as I say, it's a honeycomb kind of shape. And it's so perfectly built, if you stand in the middle, the acoustics will scare you. You know, I was taking pictures, trying to get some images through the opening of the door and everything, and I stepped back, and all of a sudden, I could hear every... You walk into this place, and it's dark, it's not lit. You have just the light from the door, and so everybody's sort of whispering, they're being very quiet. I stepped into the sweet spot in the center of this sort of honey, uh, this hive-shaped built room, I could hear every whisper in that room. It was astonishing, and that the indication was, it wasn't built for that purpose, but that it was so perfectly shaped and created that the acoustics are perfect in the thing. 3,400 years ago. So, you can visit Mycenae, and as I say, uh, you know, the walls, many of the walls, you can see back behind my lovely wife, Carolyn, um, <laughs> that a lot of it is still intact. You can visit that. It is very much a fortified city. Um, they were, however, artistic. They don't have the level of artistry or the, the sort of whimsical. And maybe that's the word I was looking for a minute ago. The Egyptian art, as impressive as it is, does ne never has a sense of whimsy. Whereas the Minoan art does. Dolphins, people playing games, uh, people vaulting over bulls. Okay, there's a sense of whimsy uh, and a light touch to it. Well, you don't get that in Mycenae, uh, the Mycenaean art, but uh, this is about as whimsical as you're going to get. But they do have a lot of ceramics. They had a, have a lot of other things. This mask um, was has been called the mask of Amin, uh, Agamemnon. You know, when it was discovered, the person who was an amateur archaeologist who discovered it immediately announced, "This is the mask, the burial mask of Agamemnon, the great king." Well, probably not. It probably came from a different period. They've now figured out, but. Um, very significant 
artwork there as well, but not nearly the artistic focus. You get the sense from the Minoans that they spent most of their lives in leisure, playing games, making art, that sort of thing. The Mycenaeans were much more focused on their military uh, conquering and their military orientation, and we get a lot more of that sort of thing. This is an example of Linear B, and there's a fascinating story about that. This, uh, this writing was actually first found not in Mycenae, but in first found um, in Gnosis on Crete. They found Linear A, which they determined was because there was more of it, that was, that was the Minoan language writing, and a different, looked similar, but different writing, which is they later found samples of in Mycenae and other Mycenaean cities, and they've determined now that that was the Mycenaean written language, which they called Linear B. Okay? Linear A, Linear B. Linear A, the Minoan language, has never been deciphered. Linear B was not deciphered until the 1950s, and it's a fascinating story. Sir Arthur Evans used to travel around and talk about the Minoan culture. A young man named Michael Ventris, when he was 14 years old, he heard Sir Arthur Evans talking about the Minoan culture and the fact that they had found two samples of writing, which they call Linear A and Linear B, and that Linear B had been discovered as being related to the Mycenaean cities and the Peloponnese. Michael Ventris, at age 14, dedicated himself to, tr to deciphering one of these languages, and he picked Linear B. He was an architect. As he grew up, he was an architect. He was only an amateur linguist. In 1952, he announced to the world that he had deciphered Linear B, and everybody went, right, yeah, amateur. It turns out he did. He deciphered it, he determined that it is a, a precursor or a, 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 a language that's phonetically linked to, but prior to, the Greek language. It's a, a syllabic language that represents the sounds that later, using a different alphabet, became the Greek language. Well, he deciphered it. And so everybody was so thrilled. This young, brilliant young man who unfortunately died at like age 32 in a car accident, um, had a great future, and I, I'm sure he was going to tackle Linear A next. He, um, he translated this, or deciphered is a better word rather than translate, and they thought, we've got all this other Linear B stuff, and now we'll be able to learn all about the Mycenaean culture. Well, they started, started using, using the key that he had created. They started translating it and discovered it's all tax records. <laughs> all right? It's all tax records. <laughs> which is true for many of the ancient civilizations, when they, when they, like the cuneiform. The vast majority of cuneiform is either storage lists, here's all the stuff we have in the Costco closet, or <laughs> it's tax records, a record of how much you owe, you know, the value of what you own, and how much tax you're paying. Okay, for you all, what's the largest single uh, source of paper probably in your house? Receipts. Receipts, tax records. The same thing was true 3,400 years ago. And so most of the Linear B that they've been able to translate now, most of it has nothing to do with telling us about the culture. All it does is tell us about how much taxes they were paying based on how much they owned. But we do read the language now. Um, and it'll be interesting to find out what they do with our records 3,400 years from now. Now, the Mycenaean civilization collapsed sometime between 1,200 and 1,100 BC. And we don't know why. All we know is that sometime in that 100-year uh, period or so, the population plummeted, travel and communications between areas within the Mycenaean uh, uh, range of influence stopped, trade stopped, writing was forgotten. People forgot how to write. This was the start of what's known as the Greek Dark Ages. There was a period of time after the Minoan and Mycenaean cultures and before the start of the Greek uh, classical period, which started around 750 BC. So the gap between around 1100 or maybe 1000 BC and 750 BC were the Greek Dark Ages. Everything shut down. There not only were no records, but civilization pretty much came to a stop. And we don't know why. You know, there were Dark Ages in Western Europe, too, although historians and anthropologists don't like to call it the Dark Ages. Well, I'm sorry, but they were the Dark Ages. <laughs> Again, people forgot, people lost the ability to read and write. 
Um, there's a wonderful book, in fact, a whole series of books by Thomas Cahill. Do you know Thomas Cahill? Mm -hmm. The first book he wrote is called How the Irish Saved Civilization. He then wrote the, um, the Sailing the White Red Sea, which is about the Greek civilizations. He wrote The Gift of the Jews, about the Hebrew culture. Um, and he's written a series of these, which he calls Pivots of, of, uh, Pivots of Civilization, I think is the name of the series. They're all wonderful. Well, Western, Western Europe, they went through the Dark Ages after the Barbarian Conquest, and they had some of the same things happen there. But the barbarians never got to Ireland. And so the monasteries in Ireland kept the books, they kept the libraries, they kept the, the scholarship. And once some of the, a lot of the barbarian tribes, the Franks and Goths and others, started becoming Christians, the Irish were responsible for bringing literacy and learning back to Western Europe. It's not actually true the Irish saved civilization, because the Byzantine Empire still had civilization over in Constantinople and the East, but the Irish did save civilization in Western Europe, and so the same idea of there being a dark age happened in Greece between 1100 or 1000, somewhere in there, and 750 BC. The mark of the end of the Dark Ages and the start of the new classical period in Greece was the first Olympic Games. In 776 BC, the various city states around uh, Greece had recovered enough that they decided to get together and celebrate the new enlightenment, you know, the new renaissance of Greece by having games that everybody would participate. These were the first Olympic Games in 776 BC. That was the end of the Greek Dark Ages. Now this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about that Dark Ages gap, and we're going to lead into classical Greek and how Greece went from the Dark Ages after the Minoan and, and Mycenaean civilizations to be the source of democracy and medicine as we know it and, and architecture and art and philosophy and so many other things. Okay? Again, I'm not going to keep you for an hour and a half today. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Did the Minoans have slaves? I have not read any record that they did have slaves. Um, so the answer is, I don't know, but I'm, I believe in my reading, if they had had slaves, I would have probably been aware of that, unless somebody else knows something about it. Yes? Were there actually lions around the area? Well, there were lions in Asia, and, and uh, probably, you know, they may have had lions in Greece as well. Obviously, they used the symbolism. Um, you will remember that there were lions in Israel. There aren't any more. One of the reasons there aren't any more is because the Assyrians, noble, you know, they valued the lions so much they hunted them into extinction in the ancient Near East. But there very, very well may have been a, a, a lion in Eastern Europe as well that is no more. So there, there are animals that have been ex extinct. In fact, um, I recall reading that the, the lion that, that was in the, the ancient Near East was probably almost twice the size of the African lions that we think about. Mm -hmm. So when the Assyrians hunted them as a sign of their manhood, okay, this is a macho thing, they, they, they had the belief that if you, if you hunt lions, then you're worthy to be a ruler. And so they got all this imagery of hunting lions. Um, you also have the Persians, you know, I, I showed you, uh, or Sargon mm -hmm. it was, that has, have images of himself sort of cuddling a lion as though it were a kitten, although it's a full-grown lion, you know, with claws and everything. So they used that imagery in the Minoan time, so, or the Mycenaean time, and so there very well may have been lines there too. I don't know for a fact, but they got that from somewhere, and you know they didn't have as, a lot of trade so that they'd be as aware of that. Anything else? Thank you all very much. One more coming. We'll talk about the. Uh, <laughs>